Let's go. Super Townsend! Will we wake? Hear the birds and see the sun. So today we are heading to Cape George Marine Works to the birthplace of our boat. We have several questions to ask Todd, who is the owner, manager, head builder, I'm not exactly sure his title, over at Cape George. And it's also going to be really nice to show you the yard and show you what kind of quality and what kind of philosophy is behind the Cape George boats uh, to maybe explain a bit more about why we like them so much. If you remember from the last episode, we've got a dilemma about our decks. Aladino explained the whole situation, so if you haven't seen that, I recommend watching it before this episode. But the Sparks Note version is that we've got some half beams under our deck that have seen better days. There's discoloration and signs of rot, but the most affected areas are not actually visible unless we remove the decks. We don't mind replacing the decks or the half beams if necessary, but the problem is that the older Cape Georges were built in such a way as to make replacement extremely difficult. So we needed to know how to proceed. Is it necessary to inspect and replace these half beams at all? And if so, how do we do it? To answer these questions, we piled into the car and drove to Cape George Marine Works to meet with Todd Ecker. Welcome to Cape George Marine Works, the birthplace of our boat, the place where we hoped to get some advice to allow us to continue our refit. But wow, seeing what this boatyard is capable of is enough to inspire us to quit our own project. This boat here is pretty much just as old as ours, yet look how she gleams after an extensive refit. These guys know what they're doing. The Cape George boats have a long and storied history of being elegant and capable blue water cruisers, and they all begin right here. We have arrived to the Cape George Yard and I'm here with Todd Ecker, who is the co-owner of the yard. So Todd has been super gracious, showing us all around, and this is the last boat that we toured today. This is Millie, a gorgeous Cape George 36, and believe it or not, this is actually the same kind of boat as the one that we bought, although it looks very different. So one thing that I find really interesting about the Cape Georges is their whole history and how they came to be. And Todd is the perfect person to help describe a little bit of that history. So you are technically the second owner of the yard, right? So how did the yard get started initially? Well, that's a good story. Um, Cecil Lang, the originator of the Cape George, um, found his way here from New Zealand after World War II and got involved in the construction industry, I think in Edmonton, Canada, if I'm not mistaken. And he ultimately made his way to uh, British Columbia. His family apparently had been in the boat building trade back in New Zealand for some, some generations, as I understand it. Anyway, he ended up moving to Everett from there and began uh, building wooden boats, a lot of wooden power boats and sailboats and a variety of things. And then um, 
about that time, this is in the early 1970s, um, found this property here in Port Townsend and was approached by a person that wanted a fiberglass uh, version of a wood boat that was a very successful uh, sailboat in the Seattle Yacht Club races, believe it or not. Um, her name was African Star and uh, she was based on a John Atkin design of the 19... 30s known as Tally Ho Major. The owner wanted a fiberglass version of this boat because he just thought it was, had beautiful lines and it was a good ocean boat and a good sailor and had good performance. Uh, so Cecil approached Ed Monk, a yacht designer that uh, has done a lot of a lot of power boats and some really good sailboats down in Bainbridge Island and uh, Ed designed, redrew the lines of African Star uh, in for, for fiberglass construction. And then Cecil went ahead and took those lines and built a mold and, uh, and the rest is history. But the first one was built in uh, early 70s, probably 72, 73. And uh, they caught on quite rapidly. The, the yard started building them every couple of months, they'd build another hull. And this is in the era when a lot of people were backyard builders and uh, West sales were popular. People would buy a hull and deck kit and with dreams of sailing around the world and and the same thing was going on with the Cape Georges. Um, they, they were selling them just as a bear hull with maybe a bear hull with ballast and so forth and people were hauling them to their backyards and setting up a tent and going after it you know and uh, some of them finished some of them didn't and you know a lot of them were sort of second hand or third hand finally the third owner might finish it that kind of thing but um, anyway that's where they started and the 36 was the the first Cape George um, the yard is actually situated near a promontory of land called Cape George. So that's where the name came from, just, just the physical locality of the place. And then as the years went by, people approached Cecil and said, well, gee, you know, I like this 36, but I want it, I want something a little bit different. I want it longer, shorter, whatever. And so the, the other models evolved. We ended up building a 40 and a 31, which were designed by a local guy named Tim Nolan, who's a is uh, still in town as a, as a yacht design office here. And then a little bit further downstream, Cecil is interested in building a slightly different version with a little bit flatter uh, bilges and a little just different shape to the hull. And uh, he approached John Anderson, who was a, an architect that was working under uh, Ed Monk, and he designed the Cape George 38. And Cecil built himself one, and that became a pretty popular model. The last of the, of the breed was the Cape George 34, designed by a, another local naval architect named uh, Carl Chamberlain, and that was done in the early 90s. So anyway, there's a whole sort of family of designs that have, that have evolved. Cape Georges of all sizes. Of, of, so, yes. Mm -hmm. So, so do, how many hulls were actually completed? I guess, first of all, of the 36 and then of the whole Cape George. Yeah, the, well, there's about 109 of the 36 hulls that were, that were built. Um, about two-thirds of those have been sold as bare hulls or partially built boats. So you'll find a lot of these 36s uh, and others, of course, but the 36 being the most prevalent back in the day, um, you'll find a lot of those were backyard built uh, boats or partially built by the yard. Quite often, you know, we would, the yard would start building them and then the owner would take over after a certain period of time when all the heavy work was done or whatever and finish it out of themselves. And I think that one of the most striking features of the Cape George is just the traditional lines and the beautiful elegance of it. And that's definitely what drew Aladino and I to the boat initially. Mm -hmm. But beyond the elegance, there's also a lot of practicality involved in these boats and they apparently sail very well. So what were some of the design philosophies that Ed Bunk and Cecil Lane should have talked about? Like what were they hoping this boat could achieve? Well, it's, you know, it's the, this is a traditional American design and it's, the hull form is based on uh, Bill Atkins designs uh, from the 30s, which were very practical designs. He used to crank out a, I think a design a month for Rudder Magazine back in the day. And they're, they've evolved as an American yacht form, um, full keel, good load carrying ability, the displacement's well distributed on the hull length. It's not excessively beamy, not excessively narrow. It's sort of an intermediate kind of a hull form, but she's got a long water line, short ends, carries a load well, and ha carries a big sail plan because it's got a lot of displacement, um, almost 50% ballast ratio. Um, so they're, they're capable of carrying a lot of sail and, um, and with the long water line length, 
and a long keel, they make an ideal platform for uh, offshore sailing because they're very easy to sail. They're self-tanning in many conditions. They're easy to set up for uh, short-handed sailing and self-steering and all that. And you can put a ton of stuff on board, and um, and they they have good they have uh, good motion because of all those features because of the displacement and the hull form and everything. So it just turned out to be a good a good combination, a very traditional combination, but a good one nonetheless. Totally. When we were comparing different boat designs and we knew we wanted to get something slightly bigger, we were amazed at that comfort ratio number um, mm -hmm. for these boats is just off the chart, even compared to so many other cruising boats that are known to be comfortable boats. This one is like, what was it, like 41 or something? 46. That brewer, 46, the brewer comfort ratio, or mm -hmm. is that what it's called? Okay. Yeah. So. Quite a few of these boats have been made now, and this yard has been in business for a long time. I'm sure you've heard of some stories of these boats, often far-flung places. What sort of adventures have these boats gone on? <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, sure there's lots. Quite, quite a few. I, I've heard a few good stories. Um, yeah, many of them, especially the 36s, have certainly circled the world. Several of them in Europe, sort of throughout the South Pacific. There's a few. Um, a few of them make their home base at, in Hawaii, of course. Uh, several, I think, in Australia and New Zealand, they sort of find their way around the world, and maybe they're trade, you know, they trade hands halfway around the world or something, depending, you know, whether you're headed to Alaska or headed to the South Pacific. Um, they're, you know, they're they've got the capability to take you there in, in relative comfort, I would say. Yeah. Um, I think we, we agree. We haven't sailed on one yet, but that's what we're planning to do, to go around the world in relative comfort. So. Nowadays, what is your main mission here at the yard? Are you mostly repairing older boats? Are you building newer boats? What have you got going on here? Well, we've got a blend of things going on. Um, we're finding that there's a lot of boats that are, were built decades ago that, that need a little bit of rehabilitation. And the, the process of building them has evolved through the years. We've always tried to improve the breed as we go. Some of the, the issues or some of the ways that the old boats were built have not stood up to the test of time as well as they might have had they been, you know, been able to be, um, have 20 years on it and then look at it again, like we've had the luxury of being able to have a real world test of, you know, decades of time and, and weather and everything. And then we look at the boat and say, well, what held up and what didn't? Yeah. Um, chiefly among the issues has been the bulwarks, uh, which were wood lined fiberglass, very stout, I mean, very stout, but over time, uh, in some situations with weather and maintenance issues and so forth, if water gets down inside the, between the wood and the fiberglass, there have been some issues. And, mm -hmm. and that's probably the Achilles heel of the older boats is the, the bulwark issue. And so we've evolved a process, um, and nowadays we build them entirely with composites, glass, and high density foams in those areas. But over the years we've evolved a repair process that we can take the boat apart uh, fairly efficiently um, strip the glass, strip the, the, the all the old wood off the bulwarks and build it back up again. Better than you know, better than new for sure. And then attend to the various hardware issues that, that go along the way. We will have an opportunity to replace all the fasteners, chain plate fasteners. Often we'll make brand new chain plates or at least inspect them, uh, die test them, um, things like that to make sure there's no cracks or issues in them. And we've also got a state of the art fabrication facility here. They can weld anything from bronze to titanium, and so we can do real high-end fabricating, water jet cutting, and all those sort of things. So we can sort of, it's sort of one-stop shopping. We can pretty much do do most of it. And then we also have talented local foundry folks in town and sail makers and all that. So it's sort of uh, Port Towns is a real mecca for boat building in a, in a nutshell. Back about the year 2006, we found out that the Sam Morse Company down in Costa Mesa, California, was shutting their doors. Um, after a similar, being in business for a similar amount of time that Cecil was, they were really contemporaries, the two guys, building a real similar boat. And so I went down there and talked to Sum Sumio Oya, who had been the, who was the current owner of the company. And um, yeah, he was, he, they just didn't have enough business to keep the doors open, etc., like many boat yards. And so he was very generous with us and, and allowed us to acquire the tooling, which we brought up to the yard here. And um, and started sort of supporting the, the, the folks that own BCCs and Falmouth Cutters. 
And uh, in the meantime, since then, we've built two brand new boats from scratch in the Bristol Channel Cutter Department. And uh, now we're building a Falmouth Cutter for a fellow. And so it's been a nice um, addition to our family of boat designs. They're all very similar in, in their mission, at least. And the hull forms are slightly different, but they're all full keel offshore sailboats. So. Absolutely. I think they fit together in a category really nicely of these sort of elegant, full keel, traditional sailboats that are meant to go far. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yep, it's true. What I'm always impressed by when I visit the yard, because this is now my second time coming here, is the attention to detail you guys put into all the boats. And we see that on ours too. I mean, ours was an owner finished one, so it's got many of the flaws that some owner finished ones can have. But the stuff that the Cape George Yard has done is always solid and it's well thought out and it's beautifully built. And details like the um, metal fabrication that you've got going on here and stuff and the, the thought that you put into everything along the way is really cool to see. And uh, we're excited to continue refitting ours in such proximity to the yard because I think we're going to be working very closely with Todd and the Cape George Yard to get some of those custom parts fitted for our boat and to get our boat all ship shape and make sure that we are building it back up uh, to the correct standards. And, and sort of moving on from that, in the last episode, we were talking about our dilemma about the decks and if we want to rip the decks up, uh, if it's worth it to rip the decks up to get at those half beams and some of the difficulties in doing so. We were talking to Todd earlier about what he thinks about that and what would our best course of action be. So would you mind sort of summarizing what you've said? So in the last episode, we did describe how our decks are built. So mm -hmm. they understand, you know, the half beams and the blocking and where that's all located. Yeah. Um, so what should it's, we do next? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that what we've done in the past in some of these situations is where the, um, where the bulwark problem has, has turned into a deck beam problem because the time has gone by and things have soaked. The easiest strategy, especially in your case, because your your deck is, is fiberglass over plywood, mm -hmm. fairly straightforward to take a cut a small section of the deck out just as an as for the first phase adjacent to the bulwark, and then go be able to go in there from the top. You really need to go in there from the top to do it right, mm -hmm. and then you can get in there and examine the blocking, remove the blocking that's bad, um, and you can actually. Um, with, with modern tools, some of the modern electric tools available now, um, you can actually snip some of the fasteners and probably replace deck beams just with even part of the deck removed. Um, but I think I would be reluctant to cut, get, get too crazy with the saw at first. Mm -hmm. You can always make the hole bigger, but Absolutely. it's going to just be involved more time and money to put it back together. So I would, yeah. I would limit it to that, but just as, in a, as the first section cut maybe you know, depending on how big the area is, just limit it to that area and then just go in there and, uh, and, and look at everything individually mm -hmm. and maybe you can see where the problem came from so that you can prevent it from happening again. Yeah, for sure. And then seal everything back up at the end so no more water starts coming Absolutely. In. Yeah, and I and think a, a big, uh, and of course, the, the going to the composite bulwark pro will, should it, totally solve the problem. Yeah, I do think so. That's that's the goal anyhow. And um, I, I wanted to ask one more question at the end before maybe we can turn our attention a little bit towards the boat we're standing next to. Sure. But the question at the end is, we now are living in a very different time from when these boats were first designed. And even when they were first designed, they were designed after an even older boat. So these are a traditional kind of boat and modern designs have moved into a very different category. So what is the place of boats like this today? You know, I think the mission is still the same. Um, as I used to say, the, the sea has not changed. You know, the, the waves and the wind are they're more, they're more vicious than they ever were, perhaps, with, with climate change and so forth. So having a really solid boat under your feet is a good thing. And so I think that largely the, the, um, the appeal it, it shouldn't be reduced for that reason. Um, and that things are, you know, the old fashioned stuff still works pretty well. And with modern uh, materials and techniques and in all, in all ways, and whether it's the hull, the sails, the equipment, the electronics, it just makes it better. Mm -hmm. And I asked you that question because the first time we visited, I remember you saying that same phrase, the sea hasn't changed. And I love that because <laughs> I think that's absolutely true. And this is a boat that's, that's designed to go offshore and keep you safe and comfortable. And it's got a lot of design considerations 
built into it for that exact purpose, and that's exactly why Aladino and I wanted a boat like this, and I think that's a beautiful answer, that the, the sea has not changed, indeed. <laughs> beautiful. So, um, what can you tell us about this boat that we're standing next to, which is, technically, it has the same name as ours. It's still a Cape George 36, but it obviously looks extremely different. Well, this is a good example of, of um, the variety of design changes you can make in a Cape George because the deck structure being all wood allows you a lot of freedom to, to create whatever you want. And so this boat was built in 1976 uh, here at the yard and um, the owners wanted a lot of deck space and they wanted, they liked the traditional short house and the little forward scuttle hatch. And so that's, that's what we built for them. It, it's been down through the Panama Canal into the Caribbean and back and she's had some grand adventures up to Alaska and uh, the current owner now is intending to sail her across the Atlantic at some point I think and um, we're doing a major refit which involves a bulwark repair, a new bowsprit, all new hardware, uh, very extensive um, electronics, um, some refits and rearranging of the, the uh, interior of the boat. She'll be ready for a whole nother life. She's absolutely gorgeous. And although our boat is never going to look quite like this because we're not going to have the bright cabin top and stuff, there are definitely some design elements, such as uh, here you can see the open cockpit design that we talked about in a previous episode um, that I was less sure about. Seeing it in person, it is really nice to have all that space. Um, still not sure about the uh, how that interacts with the waves and stuff when you're actually out sailing, but it is it is really lovely. Okay, so Todd, thank you so much for your time. Um, you've been really, really gracious showing us around. And, yeah, it's been great fun. And, it's always fun to talk boats. Yes, absolutely. Um, and we've got a lot of work to do going forward, so it's time for us to get back to our own boat soon. Um, we'll just look a little bit at this one for a bit more inspiration, I think, before we go, because this is really some eye candy here. So, Amore, I know that you are so enamored by the docks here, but I wonder if you could quickly say how you're feeling after visiting the Cape George Yard. It was incredible. I know. Uh, not only to talk to them and like, yeah, the, the amount of advice and information and we were discussing everything and like, mm, oh, if that's, that's it, then I, I would go this route. It was really, really good. But just seeing the boats in their workshop, one of our favorites, Cape George 36s, was in there. And I looked at it and I thought it was a new build, fresh out of a mold, because it looked brand new. But actually it is almost, no, it's older than our boat. But everything that goes into there, nothing gets spared and it was just too beautiful. Yeah. That's uh, the dangerous thing of visiting their yard is then you really have uh, golden standards to trying to keep up to. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, really, really. Nice but you're stuff. feeling inspired? Yeah. Totally. Ready to tackle our project again? Oh, yeah, and ready to do more demolition. Well, and I, but I think that Todd gave us a nice sort of path going forward. Um, he was basically like, yeah, just go at it very slowly. Yeah, go at it slowly. Yeah. Um, it's always easy to open up more. So start small, uh, have a look. And uh, yeah, um, more is getting revealed step by step. All right, now let's go look at some other boats. Let's go. Okay. Sir.
Robert Lewis is right there. Oh, oh well. Do you want to see like oh, one of the best, nicest Cape Georges ever? Let's go, Zach. Whoa. <laughs> oh my goodness. Mochte. Mochte nicht. I want. <laughs> wow. Oh, oh, I faint. I, yeah, I thought I'd faint in the yard already, but this is what comes out of the yard. This is, well, do you want to describe what this is? This is Sir Robert Lewis. I hope I get it right. And basically they enlarged the mold of the 40 to make a custom 45. Um, have they made more than one? I don't believe so. This was a very custom request was, from a specific person and I believe that no expense was spared. No expense was spared. So um, it is a hybrid. I think Nigel Calder was also working on the electric engines and to get all those specs right. Uh, but yeah, she is the biggest Cape George out there. Uh, composite spars. And well, and I wish we could film better, but I mean, it's covered go. up. Yeah, but yeah. this time it's a higher cover. Yeah. And you can see the teak cabin sides and just oh, the details. So this bowsprit is carbon fiber. Yeah. Painted to look like wood. And the whole spar is. And they've done a beautiful job on it. And here's another Cape George, and she is for sale. <laughs> At the time of filming, she is for sale. This oh, yeah. is so. This is a Cape George 38. Exactly, Manuai at 38, and. Well, I guess the biggest difference, uh, besides of course everything being a bit bigger, is that it has a steering wheel and not a tiller anymore. So that's a little different in the design, it's not a transom hung rudder. And apparently she has a bit uh, flatter bilges. So here we are, back on the boat. It was really great to go to Port Townsend and consult with the pros. It was uh, really nice that they took a few moments and they all were interested in where is the boat and how is it like and how can we problem solve this. And they all um, put in their thoughts. It was really great. What a team. I, I really, oh, I would go work there in a heartbeat. <laughs> I think it would be one of my favorite favorite places to work at if it wasn't this workshop for the moment. So the conclusions that we made is that indeed ours is built like the early Cape Georges were built and it does make replacing the entire deck a little more difficult and it also makes it more difficult to replace beams. Now, the advice was to start small and get an idea and get to see the blocking and the end of the beams by just opening as little as possible. And if you need to, you can always make a hole bigger. And I think since most of the beams are fine, we don't plan on replacing beams, but by opening it up, we can see that little section that we cannot actually see yet and then we can think further if it is necessary of replacing one here and there and then opening up the hole a bit more but just doing it um, for those specific beams and instead the others uh, let's call it botox treatment they will just um, if there is anything uh, rotten that needs that is crumbling and needs to be scraped away then that's what we do 
and then we'll probably fill the area out with epoxy or some similar filler. What is going to be renewed though, um, very likely, is the blocking. So by opening up a third of the side decks close to the hole, we get access to all the blocking and that is really the way to do it from above. And only by removing a little bit of the decks, you do have, get perfect access to them. So that is, that is one thing that we plan on doing. Opening up, get to see the end of the beams, replace the blocking. And since we have decided that it's very likely that we'll insulate the side decks from inside and then add the final layer of some kind of plywood or whatever is pleasing to our eye that we will find. Um, so that makes the actual repairs not visible. So it doesn't really matter like we initially planned to have a full size sheet that is bright finished and that we that would make the end effect of what we see. So we're going to end this episode here and the next episode we're going to start to get into the decks. I hope you enjoyed this one and I, I th it was really fun for us to go over to the Cape George yard and talk to Todd and I hope that some of his energy was brought through in the video. Um, and we're looking forward to continuing to bring our boat up to snuff. I don't think it's ever going to look quite like Millie. Uh, we're not planning on doing bright cabin sides and stuff that, or, or teak decks. But uh, that what a beautiful boat. Some cool inspiration. So that's it from us for this week. As always, there's going to be another episode next Friday. Thank you so much for watching. We really appreciate it. Share it with your friends. Tell other people who enjoy videos about boats and building boats. I don't know. Um, and give us a like, a thumbs up. That would help us out. And an extra big thanks to our patrons for making every single one of these episodes possible. Uh, it's pretty phenomenal that we live in a day and age where we've got resources like Patreon to connect creators and people who are interested in what they're creating. So that's awesome. If you'd like to become a patron, you can do so for as little as $2 a month. It all goes to supporting these videos and this project. Uh, and there's behind the scenes bonuses involved in it as well for you. And an extra big thanks to these folks whose names are appearing on the screen for going above and beyond to make sure that Magic Carpet keeps being produced and we will see you all next week.